good. All right. So, we're, yeah, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. I'm uh, just chilling in Detroit. We got, uh, you know, COVID and uh, <laughs> stuff. Yeah, right? You know? Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, doing okay. So you're in France. Is it- I am, yeah. I'm sitting in uh, the very southern part of Normandy. Yeah. Um, probably uh, two-ish hours south of English Channel, you know, the famous D-Day beaches and stuff. That's about a two-hour drive north, straight north of where I'm at. I heard of it. Um, <laughs> I heard the name anyway. It's like the English Channel. Yeah. That's awesome. No so, one. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, there's only one, right? Or is there more channels? Oops. Uh, well, the English Channel is just that part of the Atlantic that's between the UK and France. Gotcha. All right. So, like, uh, England is straight north of where I am, mm. essentially. Yeah. So, you're, so you're like in rural France kind of deal. From what, 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 that's what I yeah. gather from, like, the Instagram posts, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, it's, it's like a, a small uh, hamlet, um, like our uh, house, and we have a couple outbuildings, and our neighbor's house, they have a couple outbuildings. That's it. So mm. it's like a little group of, of buildings like that. It's called a hamlet. And then other than that, it's just farmland everywhere around us. That's awesome. How do you like yeah. it? You know, it's... Uh, it's an interesting story because I, I've always been a city kid and I never would have predicted that I would have ended up sort of in a rural setting like this, but Mm -hmm. um, I really love it. And, and uh, my wife and I bought the property just at the beginning of last year, uh, January of 2020, we closed on it Mm. and we, we applied for a long stay visa in February when we got back to the States and we got it on like March 5th or something. And, you know, the whole world shut down on, like, March 12th. Right. So so France closed its borders, so we couldn't come back here. But we were planning on coming back here last spring and, like, you know, seeing all the, the spring, spring, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and we couldn't. We were stuck in L.A. just sitting in our apartment like everybody else working from home, you know. And so as soon as France opened the borders at the end of July, uh, actually, they opened them on, like, mid-July, we bought a plane ticket as soon as we could and just got over here. And then we were just here from the end of July all the way through until just a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And so in that time, we kind of made the decision to make it permanent and, uh, and just move here. (laughs) So we did. That's crazy, man. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Yeah. Do you feel like, uh, you get more done because there's less to do? You know, um, it does feel that way. It does feel that way. And and there is more to do in some respects because, you know, in LA, we were just living in apartment life. Sure. You know, if the toilet, if the toilet broke, I called a guy and he can, you know, the landlord person came and fixed it, you know, whereas here, you know, we own this property and it's essentially a farm. It's pretty big property. There's a a fairly large lake. And, you know, so the two of us are city kids who are, who are learning all this stuff for the first time. So, uh, I mean, to address your question, I am getting more like sort of production work done because there's less like social activity, you know, it's just sort of yeah, yeah. Us, us at the end of the lane. There's no, nobody else around, you know, but at the same time, we're also like gardening and, you know, taking care of trees and, you know, feeding fish and like trying to get ducks to come to the lake and building fires and, you know, all this stuff that we just never yeah. have done before. Yeah. yeah. Stuff that takes time, like real life stuff. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like farm work. <laughs> farm work. That's awesome. That's, yeah, real work, right? That seems yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah, it seems a lot more healthy or something. It does have that vibe, yeah. And and there is an element to that, um, you know, being here too, just that you walk outside and it's just nothing but natural life in all directions, as opposed to living in, you know, kind of the, uh, well, it's the second biggest city in the United States, right? LA. And I mean, there just isn't any comparison. I mean, you know, I mean, we're from Michigan. Yeah. Obviously, you can, you can drive up north and kind of get a sense of things like, you know, in rural 
uh, forested kind of vibe, but it is different here. I mean, it, it definitely is a different feel. I, I would compare it more to like coastal Oregon or something like that. You know, mm. it's, it's very wet, a lot of rain, a lot of moisture. So, so do you get along with your neighbors, I guess, or have you hung out with the neighbors? Uh, a very little bit we have, yeah. They, um, they're a couple a little bit older than we are, probably in their 60s, mid 60s, to maybe 70, somewhere in there. Uh, but they kind of, they don't speak a word of English, and our French is not good. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've got our phone, you know, speaking English into Google Translate and then holding up the phone to them, you know. And that works pretty but, well, uh, or uh, kind it of? It does. Yeah. It yeah. does. Kind of, you know, I mean, it's weird, but yeah. but they're like really nice people, just the nicest people you could have ever imagined. So, I mean, that helps. And I, I think they like us too, you know, I mean, you kind of get that vibe. I, I think they appreciate that, you know, we're like these wacky Americans that are kind of trying to do it the way it's done here, you know, rather than sure. trying to like adapt the it to suit us. We're trying to adapt ourselves, you know, to suit. The, the surroundings that's amazing i imagine like yeah. uh just a few neighbors and maybe like a small pub or something you can go to or is there is there a pub i mean obviously during covid there you know it's, yeah, nothing's yeah. open and right yeah uh, france has been locked down pretty heavy for a while they are going to reopen now they're going to um like businesses are going to reopen on the 19th which is whatever a week from monday nice or is that next yeah so and then um yeah bars and pubs are going to open in uh in june so finally we'll be able to you know go to the local pub we have been there and and sat outside uh, like you know last summer so i mean there is there is one in the village probably a five ten minute drive around not even ten minutes probably like a seven minute drive from here nice well, yeah. that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I heard uh, yeah. LA, LA was worse now or something. So, I mean, I, you know. It got bad, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. when I was there, I was like, holy shit, all the homeless. But I guess it got even uh, worse. It, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's really bad, yeah. And, and it's, it's just heartbreaking, you know. I mean, yeah. we are, my wife was in LA for about 20 years, and I was there for about 10. Mm -hmm. Um, we got married like 10 years ago and um in that time in that last 10 years it sort of went from seeing no homeless people on on the street by where we live we live in studio city to every freeway underpass now is a tent community and and i mean like every one so it's not just like you know that one over there it's like they're all like that Hmm. So it's 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 really heartbreaking, you know. I mean, it's a it's a big problem there, San Francisco too, you know. Most yeah, San, San Francisco is our. When I was there in 2019, it was arguably worse in San Francisco. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and it, yeah, I mean, San Francisco is a lot more concentrated too, you know. So the right, and that's smaller, probably yeah. maybe that's what it is. But it was such a yeah. juxtaposition there of like, here's a bunch of homeless. Here's your coffee shop with like the six dollar coffee you know yeah yeah and you're like uh what <laughs> and all the locals are like yeah that's just how it is you know and i'm like what like that's crazy that's yeah not normal yeah. you know and i don't know what the solution is but my goodness like something <laughs> yeah oh i know i know it's it's just heartbreaking and and, you know, as you drive under these underpasses and, you know, both sides are just the entire sidewalk is full of tents and, and people and dogs and bicycles and, you know, trash bags. And, you know, I mean, it, it's a, it's a community, you know? Yeah. And as the time passes and you sort of are driving under the same overpasses, you know, as you do to go to, you know, whatever the grocery store, it just start, start, kind of starts to vanish, you know, it's like, and that's one of the things that's so sad is like, Somehow we're, you know, conditioned to not see it in some way. Yeah, when you're around it so much, I bet you're like, you just start to. It, get it becomes numb. normal. Yeah. yeah. Start yeah. getting numb to it. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, didn't we just print like $6 trillion? Like, <laughs> can't we just allocate a few billion or something? I mean. Yeah. 
So the homeless, I, mean, I don't know. It's a yeah. crazy thing. It really affected me. I was like, man, this is not cool. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and, you know, being in downtown Detroit, you know, I mean, you and I hung out countless times sort of throughout the, the op in, uh, in downtown Detroit. And, I mean, there certainly is a, an element of that there and always has it been. But it somehow seems more, um, I, maybe it was just because I was younger, you know, 20 years ago, but, like, it seemed more personable. I mean, I had relationships with totally. individual people that I would see all the time and I knew their name, you know, whereas what the thing in LA is just like, it's, it's massive. It's like a separate strata of how everyone, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the word. Yeah. The, well, the it's Detroit just, thing. It's big, bad. Yeah. Right. The Detroit is cold too so it was a very much right. you can't just right. hang out all year long kind of thing so la right. and, and san francisco i guess are like great to be homeless in i don't know but is that might yeah, be part I mean, of it but uh yeah um, you certainly have less of a chance of freezing to death that's for sure. right man <laughs> um but speaking of those detroit days um yeah Tell me how, like, I know, I don't know if ever we talked about this, but how did you get, we probably did, but it was, we were too drunk. I was too drunk to remember. <laughs> but, uh, like, how I did think you get included? Me then. <laughs> yeah, right. We're, there was a lot of drinking. Uh, but how a did lot you, of drinking. Yeah, how did you get hooked up with, like, Justin and the whole low rest thing? And how did that uh, come to, you know, how did that come together, you know? Um, I met Justin Ivy um, in the fall of 1999. So just just before it changed to the new millennium, but yeah, it was like probably October of 99, something like that. And he started working at the place I was working, and so um, we kind of were like, mm-hmm. you know, the the two guys are you know two out of three or four or five guys that. Um, were kind of into electronic music and you know whatever that meant at the time so that that was sort of how it initially happened it was a small internet company maybe i don't know 75 people or something like that mm-hmm. and you know it was in the it was when that was still kind of it was before the dot-com bubble burst right which happened in kind of later in 2000 so this was still in 99 oh yeah so, or, or, yeah that was a thing huh so yeah right it was still the uh Still the Clinton administration. <laughs> Everything right. was, you know, we had stock options and stuff. And it was like, hey, I'm going to get a fur coat and a Cadillac, you know, and then <laughs> gone. That's but yeah, um, so that, that's where we met. And, you know, we kind of started talking on smoke break. So, you know, what kind of music you like, et cetera. And then, you know, he told me about low res and kind of went from there. And, uh, you yeah, know, we ended up uh, working, working a lot together. And, I moved into the low res loft. That's right. And, and yeah, so there was a lot of certain, like the people I knew, I'd been in bands in Detroit and stuff before that, sort of in the early part of the 90s, um, and was still still playing live at that point, 99, 2000, and uh, live music, that is. And uh, so, you know, we kind of just became friends through that, and uh, I got involved with, with I, I didn't really know about, great core music and, and stuff. So it was like, I was just constantly learning about, you know, new bands and, and meeting people, yourself included. I yeah. remember you came, maybe you and Pete came up into the loft or you and Pete and Bethany or something like that. And, you know, there was kind of always people coming in and Justin would be like, this is, this is Chris, this is Pete, that's Mike. Hey, you know, and I'd be <laughs> like, hey, I'm like, I, who, are, who are these people? You know, what do you do? You know. <laughs> Yeah, so. that's uh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you, he was already doing low res when you met him, probably for yeah. a couple of years, right, or something like that. Yeah. Um. In fact, uh, during that first like maybe month or two, like when we met, when we started working together, um, he was just about to release low res five. Mm. which was one of Marty, Marty's records, Abel Kane, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah. and so, or no, it was, uh, it was the Faust one. So 
So it was not his Abel Cain alias. It was the other one. <laughs> yeah. I never it, remember. Yeah, but it was still, yeah, I have that. But it was low, it was low 005. It had a red label and it was the Faust record. And so he got that record from Archer while we, like during that first month. And I was like, wow, you know, you're re- releasing vinyl. You know, that was like, we were, I, I was CD only up to that point. So he was kind of my entree into even knowing about Archer and that, the whole, you know, vinyl culture of Detroit. Yeah. But, hmm. So you were doing, uh, so like this new band, Sick Jokes that you have. Uh, yeah. That, that's like, well, it seems like it's with a bunch of people you worked in in that earlier period. You kind of reconnected with them. Right. That right? right. That's exactly it. So, yeah, this is like um, sort of in the early part of the 90s. Right. Um, I, was, I was in a band called Hal, you know, named after the, the computer from 2001. Right. right. And um, we started that band sort of right like in 1990, like summer of 1990. And came out of the basement a couple years later, played our first show. Our first show was actually at St. Andrews. So like my, the first show I ever played in Detroit was at St. Andrews, which I was like, I jumped right to the top. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was uh, a, a band with myself and a couple of buddies um, from high school and then another couple people that we met shortly thereafter. And uh, I, I graduated from high school in 1988. So this was like two years later. Mm-hmm. And we started... Um, we played at St. Andrews. We opened up for um, a pretty cool, pretty like sort of at the top of the industrial genre in Detroit at the time called Knock Barrage. And, yeah, I heard, um, of, I heard of those guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were this kind of like baby industrial band, you know, ha- hadn't really played a live show anywhere other than in, in the basement and met those guys. And they liked, you know, what they heard from our, our demo tape. And they're like, why don't you come open for us at St. Andrews? We were like, holy shit. So, yeah, so, um, and then Sean from Sick Jokes was in Knock Garage. So we met him kind of that, that, you know, first time we played with them is when we met. And then uh, Bob and Kenny were in hell with me. So Sick Jokes is me, Bob, Kenny, Sean, and then um, a singer from LA named Plasmic, who uh, was actually a friend of a friend. None of us have ever actually even met Plasmic in person. It's, It's been entirely a studio relationship interesting the power of yeah. internet yes indeed indeed yeah and the whole uh, the entire recording process has been all remote you know i'm i'm in normandy bob and kenny are in detroit sean's mm-hmm. in austin and plasma right. in la so what do you what do you guys use like uh, do you use the same daw or something or how does that work we don't. Um, we just fly wave files back and forth. I use Pro Tools. Um, Bob uses Sonar, so he he does a lot of sound design work, and he'll just send me. You know, we'll we'll obviously be in agreement at like what we're working on, what the BPM and the key are, mm-hmm. and then he'll just you know he'll go nuts, kind of creating sound design, creating a bunch of different types of parts, you know, noisy beats and bass lines and stuff, and just kind of send me groups of stuff, and then I I do a bunch of editing work. I'll record guitars. We'll send it to Sean. Sean records his own vocals. He'll send me the wave file of the vocal back. Same with Plasmix. She'll send me the wave file of her vocal. And then um, Kenny, obviously playing, he's a drummer. You know, mm. he, he goes, goes in. He actually recorded his parts at the Temper Mill in Ferndale. Okay. And uh, and then Tony Tony Hamera was the engineer. Is the engineer one of the engineers at the Temper Mill? Has been forever. He was in a Knock Garage also. He was a guitar player. Mm. So, and then actually we've got a bunch of remixes on the record, one of which is by our buddy Justin, who was also in Hal with us. And one right. of them is by our buddy Scott, who goes by the voodoo organist, also in Knock Garage. Mm. And then, of course, yourself and, uh, and Mike Gross, who was one of your crew. Yeah. In Good fact, I met Mike through you, I believe. Really? Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of, it's a small scene after, you know, Yeah. all is said and done. Yeah. Only a few people that are, uh, you know, that are into the weirdness, yep. you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, a big part of it was sort of a, a, a nod back to that, you know, the old band and the old scene of, of 
you know, shit, 30 years ago, right? 1990, mm-hmm. 2020. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, it initially started as just sort of a, hey, everything sucks in 2020. And it's the 30th anniversary of this band we were all in where we were all screaming about how everything sucks. Why don't we do some of that again? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. It's amazing that you guys are uh, able to have a functional relationship over the internet. I I think that's uh, like musically, you know, I think. Yeah. That's cool. You know? Yeah, it really is. And it never was intended to be, you know, a live band or anything, but after we, um, we ended up getting signed to cop international um, which is a super cool, you know, niche industrial yeah. gold wave label. And, uh, you know, Stabbing Westward. And, um, uh, John Fryer is the, the A&R guy for the label. It's, it's and, a partnership. Uh, and Chiasm. Chiasm, yeah, which he produced. Um, another, another, another Detroit person. Um, totally, yeah, yeah. So it's, yep. uh, it's interesting. She used to date Pete for a while, I guess. So, yeah. See, and look at that. I mean, that brings it full it's circle a, back to how small, I met you. Yeah, it's a small, uh, small world out there. Yeah, with seven yeah, billion yeah. people. I don't know how that works, <laughs> but it is. You know, I mean, I don't know. I think of you know the Midwest, obviously Chicago, um, but Detroit certainly. I mean, these are places there they are the industrial places right you know so it's, uh, in the states at least and so it's like that you know yeah. those of us who were there who came from there are like you like we're bona fide you know <laughs> yeah there's a i guess there's a bit of clout to being from detroit or something when you go out there you know they're like oh yeah. detroit yeah. and you're like oh okay you know <laughs> What are you going to do? Shoot yeah. me now or something, you know? Uh. <laughs> yeah. I always love that saying there's no art in, in utopia, right? So it's like the, the coolest art always comes from the shittiest places. Not that Detroit's shitty, but you know what I mean. Uh, it, it, it can be a quite uh, demanding on your psyche after a while. I think uh, that's probably a reason why you moved out of here too, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I moved out of Detroit when I was 40, and I, at the time I said 40 winters was enough, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, the winter time, that's bleak, and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Six months, of, six months of gray. Gray sky, gray ground. Yeah. Gray mood. Well, we did, yeah. Well, so, uh, what's the craziest low-res era? memory you have um if you can share it you know (laughs) (laughs) there yeah there certainly are some that are are probably not not shareable i mean i was i was a uh an observer in a lot of ways more than a a participant you know i mean i was participating in socially of course but not i i mean i never had a release on low res um yeah i had a release on on rematter which was uh justin's kind of you know side label to release other types of music for a minute um but yeah so uh, i mean i was in the center of it there living at the loft where you know people that would come into town that would play at one of justin's various yeah would stay there you know so i was kind of the host in some ways of, of a lot of that so there were certainly some crazy, you know, party based activities that went on. Uh, one of the craziest sort of uh, out in public things that I remember pretty fondly was uh, the short series of shows where Basic and Dormouth came into town and and did the stuff they do live, you know. I remember, uh, those. I remember those well. Uh, well, yeah. somewhat well. I mean, there was. Right. Uh, Exactly. Yeah. A lot through a uh, through a, a haze of uh, what uh, kamikazes, French whores, some some, some, some type was, of sort of yeah. Silly I shot. guess we, I guess we were doing those crazy shots. It was I didn't even remember that until you just said that. So yeah, there was quite there was a series of shots there. 
for were, several years. But I think they were like mixed in with just like beer and whiskey too. It wasn't just uh, sure because you're sure. drinking like the regular shots and then or whatever the regular drinks, and then it'd be like, hey, let's do these crazy shots yeah. now, and then yeah. uh, yep. it was crazy shot time. But I I, I do remember yeah. Like, so basic and Dormouth at Third Street. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, that was those cra- shows are crazy. I remember basic like drinking a whole like fifth of vodka and DJing. You know, and he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he would just like down it, and then he and he was amazing. Yeah. He was amazing. Like uh, he was, was amazing. Both of those guys were amazing. I mean, they were just yeah. such. They were so charismatic, and they were such good performers. And yet they were playing breakcore music or, or you know, whatever subgenre they were playing. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they seemed like arena rock stars, kind of, you know? Like yeah. In, in how they, yeah. They had the rock star personality, you know, kind of a yep. larger than the place they were in for sure. I mean, all the 25 oh. people that were there enjoyed it, but I yeah. think. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or was it 15 people? I don't know how many. <laughs> Uh, I'll go with 25. 25 you know? is, seems legit. I won't yeah. push it past 35. You know? No, no, that, that's pushing it. That's pushing yeah, it. I think 25 is just about right. That little back room there. Um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. I remember a cover, uh, a cover of Black Sabbath. Um, whoops. Sorry, I knocked you out here. Black Sabbath War Pig that uh, that Dormouth did. Do you remember lost, that? I do. I think I lost visual on you here. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. There. Yeah. Uh, Black Sabbath War yeah, Pig. That. I vaguely remember that. I mean, I gotta dig it up to remember what exactly it sounded like. But yeah. He had a uh, he had a series of poster board like cue cards. Right. And the, every. And every line was on there, you know, generals gathered in their masses. And then, you know, he would hold that up and then throw it. And then the next one <laughs> behind it. Yes. <laughs> that was a good And idea. of course, it was this crazy, you know, great chord drum and bass version of, of War Pig. It was great. Yeah. And he was like wearing a dress or something, right? It was yeah, a, he's, yeah. Like a prom dress. A prom yeah. dress. Yeah. Right. With his hairy, hairy chest like coming through the, the bodice. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And then now now he's doing the CrossFit thing. I don't know if you're following any of that that he's doing. I'm not. I'm not. Like for real, like serious, like like fitness? he like he started uh so he's in Florida, uh I think still and he started this CrossFit gym probably like twelve, fifteen years ago. And he, he's the owner. So he's still like buff as hell. And uh wow. Yeah. So he's just all in on the fitness. Which he always was, you right know, on. like a fit guy. Yeah. You know? Right. It was very unusual yeah. in our like skinny or whatever unhealthy looks that everybody <laughs> else had, you know, and he was just like, Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the break core warrior guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know, I saw um, uh, uh, Derek Basek was was from L.A. and you know back back then, right? I mean, I, right. I was from L.A. You know? and uh, and I, I did see um, uh, some some flyers and some promo for him performing in L.A. when I ended up you know out in L.A. But yeah, I never made it out. I never made it out to a live show, but yeah, I was gonna yeah, ask I, you I, if I, you guys ever you know managed to catch up. No, we didn't. Nope, nope. The last time I saw him was in Detroit in whatever that would have been, like, I don't know, 2005 or something? I don't know. That was, like, 2003 or something. Those. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. The Third Street shows. Yeah. yeah. Man. Yeah, he's uh, he's been back in Detroit, uh, I think, a couple of years ago he was here. Played City Club. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. I've had had him out a couple of times, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's still doing. He's doing a lot of modular stuff now. And uh, oh, really? Yeah, like he got into gear. 
so he's doing these uh he's got a really popular like instagram presence where he's essentially he's playing with like a different piece of gear every other day and they're and they're okay, kind of cool. getting like sponsorship from these people you know and yeah uh, nice. yeah so they just send them stuff from what i understand you know uh, yeah so he's got all the latest uh electron whatever you know uh things and He's just rocking it, man. Yeah, you should check out his right, cool. I, I, IG or whatever. What, uh, I will. What, so you said you use Pro Tools. Like, uh, what about, I you use any hardware at all, or is it all software now? Um, well, electronic speaking, no. Um, I, I do have a bunch of guitars. Right, uh, you so play guitar, yeah. I, I do, yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty much the, the hardware. It's all software from the... The synth side. Um, in fact, I think I see uh, perhaps a synth that I used to yeah, own right behind your yeah, head, right there. Yeah, that's the Kurtzwell over here. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got that. I got that K two thousand back in. Uh, I'm gonna go with 1996. Oh man, that's kind of late. That's kind of late for that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, some, it was something some... I had always wanted. Yeah, baby. There's some floppies. I still have all mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a a drum kit that's spread out across two of them. You can chain them together, you know? So, cool, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. That's 1.44 megabytes on each one of these babies, you know? Yeah, baby. I was going to operate it, but I don't know. I uh, I kind of like, you know, the low fineness of the floppy. It's like yeah. it still works, you know? So I, yeah. Each kit is like 61 drum samples, you know. There's little one That's shots, great. you know, mono samples or whatever. And uh, yeah, yeah. There's that uh, software. It's called Wave 2 KRZ. I don't know if you ever used it, but uh, I did use it. Yeah, yeah. It, I remember it. It like maps out the samples to the keyboard, so when you load the um, the disc in, it's already mapped out. You don't have to you know, fuck with it or whatever. So. Right. Right. Map, the, map the keyboard. Yeah. I mean, I, um, that, that K 2000 served me very well. And I'm, I'm very glad that it ended up going to you. As yeah, man. To some, some stranger <laughs> on reverb. <laughs> on reverb.com. Yeah. I still, I mean, I have all this gear, but, uh, you know, I, I can do everything in Ableton's or whatever. Uh, but I don't know. It's just interesting to still touch things and, and uh, the whole interface sure. of the machines is interesting to me. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's always a, a tricky thing to like get the gear in the computer and have it be in time and, you know, there's latency yeah. and all that. But, uh, right. I just got this sync box, this, uh, I don't know if I can lift it up here. And this thing right here. Okay. And it's uh it's pretty cool. It uh sends uh MIDI clock and DINSync. You can it has a bunch of DINSync outs, but it's like this audio pulse that comes out of your one of your audio outputs of your sound card, and you put it uh -huh. in here. And then that uh, sounds like a clock that's more steady. Okay, cool. To, to your machines, you know, and then you can track them a lot easier. So th that's kind of like the the workaround solution for the cool. You, when you send MIDI clock out of a computer, usually there's like a lag. Uh, yeah. Because of the processing. I remember. Yeah, yeah. It's probably why you're like, "Fuck this gear," you know. <laughs> like, I can't get it. Well, to, yeah. I mean. It was about for me, you know, that the the process of composition is never like I never do it in a short amount of time. It's always stretched out over days or weeks, right? right. And back in the days of like when I first got that K two thousand, you know, I had another couple of outboard synths, and they're all connected, you know, to a beige box to a Mac, right? And and you would start a composition. And then sometimes it would be, you know, two weeks later that you come back to it and all, you know, everything was essentially lost, right? It was, it was stored like 
on the, the Kurzweil floppy or whatever, you know, and the MIDI data was in the computer. And it was just a never ending sort of like, where, what patch was that? You know, what? And just yeah, yeah. years and years of like not being able to get back to where you were, you know, that was, so when finally, when I got Pro Tools and was able to turn everything into audio and not, you know, worry so much about settings on the outboard gear, it was like, I'm never going back. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, some of these more modern things, of course, they save a lot better, you know? Sure. Sure. So sure. like and, there's, but you still have to take notes. I mean, I have like, yeah, no, I have notebooks where, or now I'm doing it on my phone because it's easier, but I have like, yeah, yeah song seven, you know, a four, yeah. you know, whatever. Like, so yeah, it's still a thing in the latter, uh, the latter part of the nineties, sort of like, uh, kind of 98 to 2001 ish, uh, 2002. Um, I was in a different uh, band called 19.5 Collective, and there were five of us all playing rigs, and yeah. they were all chained, chained together with MIDI time codes. And so there was a master um, sequencer running on a you know late 90s Mac laptop, sending MIDI time codes to all you know all of us standing at a rig of upward gear, and we would have to have like practice for practice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we'd have to set up all the gear and get it, get it all working and working together. And that, you know, that would be a day or a night unto itself. And then we'd be like, okay, everything's working. See you again on Thursday, you know, and then, and then we could actually practice, you know, and like that was sort of another phase of the, of the never again <laughs> for me. Yeah. That's, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not. So when I play live now, I don't bring all this shit. I just sample most of it into the sampler. And that's kind of nice. like the, the yeah. trick with it. And also, like, so I have uh, this guy right here, the Digitech. And uh, yeah, it's small, you know, and uh, whatever. But I can, like, I'm not going to bring the Kurzweil, you know, out. Because I, I don't right. want it to break, too. But also, it's like, I don't need. It's heavy as fuck. It, it's heavy as fuck. Even, like, did you see ever see the rack mount version? It's also, did, yeah. it's yeah. also heavy as fuck. Like, it's yeah. big. It goes back far, you know? Like, right, yeah. <laughs> Super deep. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I just sample stuff in here, and uh, I use like another drum machine and a tabletop synth, you know, and that's it. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know, but yeah, this Digitech thing, I can. The recall thing about it is, I can send uh, program change data. You know, it has uh -huh. eight, it has eight MIDI track outs, so I can load up a pattern and it'll send the program change data to load up all the patches on the stuff. Wow. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you have to program it in, I'm saying, <laughs> you know, but once you did it, I oh, guess, it's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, it's a, I don't know if sick joke. Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to step on you. No, go ahead. Um, I don't know if sick jokes will ever play live, you know, given the fact that we're kind of scattered around the world. But if we were to do so, I would want to put as much as possible on a backing tape. And then right. we all would be able to theoretically practice on our own. Yeah. And then get together in whatever city the gig is, you know, a couple of days before the gig and, and practice together for the first time. <laughs> And yeah, then, I mean, uh, I, essentially, yeah. this this the sampler is like a backing tape for me, you know. Uh, sure. And there's other ones that like MPC, like MPC Live, that one is great. Yeah. It has like six outs, and the screen looks like Logic or whatever. You know, it's got the piano roll. It's got sure. you know everything, so you can load up full songs on there, full everything. And you know, I like that better than like uh i don't know just a laptop or something just because i don't trust laptops they're always doing yeah shit live you know i don't know yeah and you know those years that that we were referring to earlier sort of the uh the late 90s and like into the 2000s like there were so many people that were doing laptop shows yeah. oh you know uh that brings that brings to mind another um uh, an artist I saw at Third Street on one of those low res nights, Flash Bulb. Remember that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he gave one of the best laptop sets 
and like I think he had a it was a Windows laptop and he had like a Korg Chaos pad and that was it. And you know he was doing enough with the Chaos pad, adjusting whatever software he was adjusting to make it a true performance. You know whatever he was doing wouldn't necessarily be that same way the next night, right? Um, and and that there was that sort of that fine line on the lap. I guess my point being. We saw so many laptops that where somebody would just hit the space bar and then pretend to make changes. Yeah, they really right. had they really had bang really hard. You know, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> and 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 you know that thing where you're standing behind a, a laptop pointing out the thing that's going to be really cool that's about to happen. Yeah, it's about to. Yeah, it's about to drop. Yeah, yeah. there's a cool thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that was. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> Definitely a lot of laptop. People were like were selling gear left and right at that time. And yeah, yeah. I and I really enjoyed doing all gear sets with Pete. You know, because we could make fun of. I know you guys, people. <laughs> like, so. Yeah, yeah. You guys were were such a breath of fresh air there. You know, um, I think the first time I saw Delian was also at Third Street, and uh, you know, you guys had to complete essentially racks of yeah, you know, I mean not racks, but like apron stands or something, right? Two Didn't stands, you have like two yeah. apron stands? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was just great. It was great seeing you guys in your, you know, your full on uh Dune still suits uh <laughs> costumes. I think that was more like like you were like cyberpunk Keith Emerson, you know, with multiple keyboards and stuff. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was uh that was a fun time and uh <laughs> Now, but people play a lot now, like 20 years later or whatever. People play a lot with like old hardware now, you know? Where it's, yeah, it's refreshing. It's cool. Yeah, it's like cool. all the kids are it like, it is cool. you know, I'm like, yeah, I got this drum machine and, you know, whatever. And so it is interesting. Yeah. In fact, it's like not cool to play with a laptop anymore, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, it kind of, it kind of never was, right? But, <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, there, there was a time where it was like the thing where people like. I, I know, I know. It wasn't cool though. You're just looking at a person with a laptop. But, exactly. But exactly. It, it was, was what it was, but it certainly wasn't cool. <laughs> it was just one of those things where I think like the complexity of Raycore necessitated, uh, you know, a certain computing power, and it's like good luck yeah. getting that out of like that 2001 drum machines. You probably could. But it's a lot easier to do it in whatever people were using at the time, whatever tracker yeah. is or whatever, you know. Right. I was going to say, like, I know Abel Kane, you know, Marty and, and those, those guys were tracker software, like, I think running on an Amiga, even, he, right? Yeah, he did some Amiga stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think and he, then, yeah, he, I don't know what he was using later, but yeah. When I saw him live, like uh, when he would come to Detroit to do low res stuff, he had a Windows laptop, I believe. Yeah, or that's maybe weird. he even had like a Windows desktop. One of those guys had like a full beige Windows box with a CRT monitor. You know? That was uh, remember Zynopticon, that guy. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Pittsburgh, you know, and he uh, right, he, right. He would come out with two desktops and the DJ mixer. Right, right. And I was yeah. like, he would DJ between the two computers and be like, one running free loops and one running reason, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yep. cause the computers were not powerful now. It was just like at that brink where they weren't powerful enough to run both of those at the same time, I guess, you know? Because now you can, I'm sure, run. So he, yeah, yeah he, he, he just does laptop stuff now if he does anything. Yeah. It's, uh, He's yeah. in the he's in the ended up uh on the west coast as well. Uh oh really? Yeah. Like we played like after that LA show, uh we yeah. went to San Francisco and played with him. Uh he was one of the people, you know, that organized or cool. you know, participated, organized that party. Nice. Uh, that was a lot to keep. Yeah, I really enjoyed your your show in LA. It was a, that was a cool venue. And yeah. yeah, it was cool. Cool sound in there. Cool people at the show. Yeah, I liked thanks. everything about that show. Yeah, you guys sounded great. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was pretty small, but I mean, I I don't know. 
away. It was, it was kind of like on a whim going out there, you know? Yeah. That guy who put it together, David Christian, he's, uh, he's a good guy and he's, uh, he's been doing this Twitch stream stuff, which I was doing a little bit of DJing for. Um, he's, he's going hard with that. Like, I don't know if you're ch- cool. checking out any Twitch stuff, but. Um, you know, I, I've only seen recordings of it. I, I haven't actually watched anybody's Twitch stream live. And it's, I, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It is. It's well, what it is, is like, it's like at the AOL chat room. You remember those? Uh-huh. Like, I do. Where every, you, know. like, you don't have people's real names. It's like whatever name they made up. And so you're right. just talking right. to people. But there's a DJ, like there's a little video of like somebody playing. And once in a while, right. you have emojis and stuff. <laughs> and you can be like, <laughs> dragon emoji or whatever it is, you know. And uh, it's funny. It's like uh, it all comes back full circle like that, you know. With the- yeah you're in this chat room and you're just, and people don't talk about the music either. They're just talking about whatever happened to them. You're just like, yeah, my cat is sick. And you're like, okay. You know, whatever. Right. Right. Well, and, you know, during COVID, I mean, I think there's some pretty vital stuff that's gone online. In those totally. Of, I, th- I mean, I think it's necessary, uh, you know, in, in a certain way to have like a little bit of a community, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's an approximation. Absolutely. It's not as good as whatever, but uh, right, it's something, you know. I can't wait for like the yeah. VR experience where you put them on or something. You're in a club and you can interact. Sure. I, don't, I don't know how far away we are from that. I want to say 2045. Kind of. <laughs> oh, it'll be sooner than that. I mean, I think we're on the cusp of that. I, I know, but people said that about flying cars, you know, for a long time. Yeah, but I mean, there are <laughs> flying cars. You can get a flying car right now. Really? Yeah. Like, like, oh, yeah. Like Back to the Future flying car? Like, <laughs> like Not quite. No? Not quite. I mean, it looks like a small plane. Okay. For the most part. You know, it's got... Uh, whatever retractable wings so it's a plane and then you can land and retract the wings and then drive it along the ground i see you know but, it, so, but it's not it doesn't hover though it flies it does not hover that's what i'm saying like that, that hovering it's technology yeah yeah it's it's did the, did the, did the delorean hover yeah it hovers yeah i guess it goes down to the end of the street and then kind of yeah, it, it can so. just fly. It doesn't need wings. It's 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 some kind of uh, I don't know, magnetic, whatever. But you know, I, I heard this the interview. Fusion reactor. Yeah, the fusion. Well, that that whole thing. But yeah, well, they were going up to 2015. So you know, forget about That's it. That's true. It was the That's future true. for them. Total total future. 85. Looking from, forward from 85. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They thought this was shit was going to be happening, you know, and uh, it's not happening. It's interesting to see. Did you like, ever read? Oh, sorry. sorry. No, no, it's just interesting to see what like the sci-fi novels were predicting and what part of it came uh, true, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna mention a, uh, a Back to the Future thing, but yeah, I mean, I think Star Trek is is probably has the most. You know, like the, the bullet point list that there were the most things that have come true. Hmm. Like what? I mean, well, uh, I mean, the, the communicators, you know, right? I mean, the, the, the whole yeah. concept of what a, what a smartphone has become to us. True. You know, and, and in like the next generation, you know, they have those iPad things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, uh, they have now shown that warp a warp bubble is possible. I mean, it's not in, obviously practical. Yeah, well, yeah, but there were like further. It can be future, done. So yeah, it could be. Yeah, but I think it will be done. You know, um, they've teleported information. They've teleported a photon from one place to another. So you know, yeah, I don't know about matter, like, matter quite yet. But. 
some kind of quantum entanglement thing or however that yeah. works. However yeah. that yeah. that whole mess works. Yeah, it's uh spooky action at a distance, right? Is that what Einstein called it? Is that what it is? All right, I, yeah. I did guess. you ever did you ever hear that? I heard yeah, that, that. That was what they referred. To, yeah. I heard that phrase. I didn't know it referred to like quantum entanglement. Entanglement. Or, yeah. 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 What, uh, uh, I was just going to say about Back to the Future. Yeah, there there was a great. Um, remember that magazine Starlog? I don't know if it still exists, but it was like a mm-hmm. sci-fi, you know, sci-fi monthly magazine mm-hmm. in the eighties. And uh, there was this great article shortly after Back to the Future came out that was it was written by a physicist and it was it was sort of the exploration of the concept that there's two Marty McFly. Ah. So there's the Marty there's the Marty McFly that we're following along mm-hmm. who has kind of a cra- a crappy life and then he goes back in time and then comes back to nineteen eighty five and his life has improved, right? But there also then was the Marty whose life was already good, who had the girlfriend and the nice truck and all right. you right? Mm-hmm. And he his life switched. You know, he he inhabited the 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 Marty's existence that was not good by the end of the movie. And this guy in this article, the guy that was writing this article in Starlog where he's like laying out the case for this. Uh, he says there is a frame in one of the shots where it's, you know, overlooking the mall parking lot where Doc Brown gets killed by the Libyans, you know, where it all goes down. Yeah. And you can, you can see from the vantage point of the parking lot, like sort of looking up into the distance of like the outskirts, there's a figure that sort of steps into the light at one point and he's like, and that's the other Marty, the huh. Marty whose life it was good and he you know and i was like as a whatever in 1985 i was like 15 right? uh-huh. so i'm reading i'm reading this style i go whoa you know and then of course there would be a the theater that would be a <laughs> great film that would be a yeah. great movie like seeing the you know rich the alternate back to the yeah exactly. yeah like where it yeah. suddenly goes to shit and he's like what the fuck happened here he's gotta, <laughs> yeah, gotta right. kill the other mom. right I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, you know, so the Back to the Future. Uh, I was for for a long time. I was like, man, that's uh, obviously they got it from somewhere, right? Um, yeah. But it's just such a interesting way about you know, the went about uh, describing time travel. And then yeah, I read uh, Weapon Shops of Aisher. Did you read that? No. That's by who's the uh, author. Oh uh, God! Why is that escaping me? All right, hold on. I gotta look it up now. Got your, uh, your you need your Joe Rogan podcast assistant to look stuff up. For you. I know. I need a producer. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, A A Van Vogt. He was like. Uh, oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I know the name. Yeah, but he he got all crazy towards the end of his career, but. Anyway, like uh, the that whole Back to the Future way they would go back in time and change stuff and then come back and whatever, it was exactly in that book. Except it was very political. Okay. Yeah. So like there, you know, the the premise as I remember it, it's been like fifteen years since I read it, but it was uh, this weapon shop that was kind of outside of time. And you can get these guns that uh, to protect yourself, and the government can't shut it down because it's, you know, autonomous. You know. Okay. Yeah. I, I love the concept already. That's cool. Yeah. So, so it was very like uh, not anti-government, but very like you know, it, it was there was a message, you know, and it's all yeah. the time traveling that happened in there was. Uh, very much to to the end and so it's funny when they take that and make it into this like pop teenage drama you know and back to the future and that's how it gets out to like popular culture you know so yeah yeah (laughs) yeah and i I love that that bit in the uh that event you know the final avengers movie where they do the time travel and they have a scene that specifically is because of that point right 
where they're like, no, no, it doesn't. It's not like Back to the Future. <laughs> because like everybody in the movie going audience and, you know, the characters on the screen all have this like Back to the Future template in our minds, right? That's how time travel works. Yeah. I and mean, like, it, they're, they're like, no, no, it's not actually like that. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you know, the other one, the, t- the other time travel was that Slaughterhouse Five, right? By Kurt Vonnegut, where he would right, just, right. he wouldn't, he would just go inside his body or whatever. Or I don't, it was, it was like his consciousness would travel to different parts of his life, kind of right. Thing. So it was like a totally right. different yeah. picture of that time travel idea, but sure. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about what you said in, in, in terms of sci-fi and the use of time travel and like the, uh, there being a political element to it. Right. Yeah. It seems like that would, that sort of rings the most true to how human society, you know, works is that inevitably there's conflict and war, you know, et cetera. And, um, one of the Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Enterprise, I think, they had a pretty cool treatment of that concept. Um, I think they called it the temporal Cold War, where there were the like, factions of, you know, different people along the timeline that mm-hmm. were, for political reasons, changing things. And then there were like, you know, terrorists and governments, you know, battling throughout time. I, I thought that was pretty cool, too. I, I-, I appreciated that take on it. Yeah, there's there's been a few TV shows too with the uh, can't name them per se, but I've seen it. <laughs> I know they all start to blend together. Oh man, there's so much TV out there. I I hate how good it is because it just sucks you right in. Not even it really does. Yeah, but but you know what's a good way to break that though is to like so I watched uh, I rewatched Godfather two the other day. Oh, cool. Uh, and it was so good, you know, and such a well-paced thing. And it had a message. He's all along in the end. I don't know if you remember that movie, but. I remember it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a brilliant. And then you go and you watch, like, Captain America or something like that. <laughs> and you're like, God damn, this is bad, you know. <laughs> like, it seemed good, you know, when you don't have a point of comparison of, like, to real filmmaking. Uh but then yeah, you watch yeah. like a real movie and you go back to this TV shit. Uh, yeah. and it's, it's bad. You know, you're just like, cause you know, like one of the things in the Godfather is like, you, you can see what's going to happen to the character, bef- but the character doesn't know it, you know? Yeah. And it's right. like this sense of like, when is it going to happen? It just builds all this tension. Right. And like when Mike's brother, Fredo or whatever, like, yep. you know, he's going to whack him and he's just right. letting him hang out with his kid and take him fishing and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. But you're just yeah. waiting for the hammer to drop, you know? Yeah. It's totally. such, it's such a crazy, like little psychological uh, thing, you know? And there's none oh, of that in, sure. in like the modern TV. There's no, I don't know. There's just no understanding of like, that pacing and that foreboding, like, I don't know. I just haven't yeah. seen a lot of that, you know? Well, I mean, they gotta, they gotta fill that time on however many streaming, you know, I mean, there's, there's more content than you could ever watch. Right. And it's like, it can't all be great. <laughs> no, I mean, it's great in terms of, I mean, back in the day TV, you know, now TV oh, well, is yeah. so much, I mean, they just put so much more money into it. It's like, you have these million dollar right. episodes of these TV shows or 10 million or whatever. They just Right. And, and like during the era of Godfather two, if you were a television actor, you would be considered sort of a laughing stock at that point. Right. There were like two separate worlds. Right. And if you were, if you were a film actor, you were serious. And if you were a television actor, you know, good luck kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at their cute television, You're right? And now it's like almost the opposite, like where the money and the big names and everything is sort of about television and films are, you know, somewhat secondary or whatever. Well, they're all coming out now almost immediately on the film, yeah. even, even when they make the films, you know, they're all coming out yeah. like on HBO Max or whatever it is. And 
Yeah. My uh, my, my buddies who work in in the industry in Hollywood, I mean, you know, they, anybody who works on movies loves movies, you know, and they're big fans of movies, and it's like a a tragedy to you know the folks that that work on particularly like in, you know most of my experience over the years hmm. has been in the post post side of things audio post and i have a, a real good buddy in in la who, who's a, an audio post guy and works on big movies and like for him it's like a, an absolute tragedy that people are not going to see that work in a theater on a big screen like there there is no compromise at no time would a home system no matter how good it is be acceptable you know for you know the people that are are, are working on it if you're a, you know, yeah big, big, big it is I, I do see his point but at the same time i i want to stay home <laughs> even if there was no COVID, i'm like ah, i'm not going anywhere yeah i like the comfort of my own home to watch a movie and i think yeah. you know, if you do have like surround sound and a big screen yeah. i mean it's not I mean, of course, a giant screen is better, but you know, it's yeah. uh, they're just gonna have to navigate this shit because people. I don't know. After yeah. COVID, I think we just can't go back to the same, like having meetings and offices know. and going to the movie theater. You know, like I know, man, and and I think it's gonna be years yet. You know, before we're truly there is no more COVID. You know? oh, man, you think so? I think, yeah, probably. I do. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't mean that the lockdown and you know quarantine and all that stuff is still gonna. I think that'll probably be, at least in the states where you know vaccinations have really, you know, they they got their act together. Yeah. Over yeah. here, mo most people, a majority of people in the EU are not vaccinated yet. Really? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's lagging way, way behind. Well, they I mean, also they also went all in on that AstraZeneca thing, which yeah, I don't think it's good. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Reading all this bad stuff about it, and I'm like, I don't really get that. No. <laughs> like, but I, I, don't I know. know who knows what's a good one. I got the Pfizer one or whatever. So. Yeah, we got Pfizer too. We we were real lucky to um, we 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 were here for like seven or eight months. Yeah, and then we flew back flew back to LA for less than two months and like closed down all of our stuff there. And we were so lucky that we got both Pfizer shots while we were there. That's awesome. Yeah. Good. good yeah. Work on that. yeah. It was yeah. really, it was pretty nerve wracking, you know, it, being unvaccinated. I mean, we got tested, we were negative and then like having to fly into LA. But, yeah. You know, oh man. No, well, fuck that. It was, yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. Just wearing those double masks or whatever, and just yeah, what double? We had double masks and we had the face shield. Oh Jesus! You know, and so you pull down your mask to like eat and take a drink, but still with the shield in front of you, you know, and wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. You know, it's like you know this this whole COVID thing is exposing our vulnerability, which is the the eating. Uh, and the intake like that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Why can't we figure out something else here? I mean, can we go <laughs> solar or what? You know, the plants figured it out. We can't figure it out. I don't know. We have to like uh, physically put parts of reality into our mouth to like <laughs> stay in it. You know, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. So barbaric. What's that all? It brings to mind a scene. I don't remember what it's from, but it was like two aliens. Uh, I mean, they look like like they're two human men, but they're uh, the one is saying to the other, "Yeah, they're made of meat." <laughs> and the other one's like, "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, meat. They're they're made of meat. Their bodies are meat." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole thing is not uh, efficient. I mean, it's. You live maybe 80 years if you're lucky, you know. I mean, I don't know. I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll figure something in the next 40, 50 years here, you know, uh, before blowing ourselves up or something, you know, or however it goes down. It'll probably be something stupid, though. 
people are always like, oh, yeah, it's going to be blown up. It's like, yeah, we'll probably still die from COVID when we're older or something stupid. Right. Like, oh, it'll be, oh, it'll be stupid. It'll be it, stupid. Like, this whole pandemic has just been like, it's just like, yeah, it's not going to be like zombies. It's going to be like, you know, sneezing people or something. You yeah. Know? Like, <laughs> and, and like, and lies. You know, that one of the songs on Sick Joke uh, is, is called Ruled by the Liars. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's just so crazy. Uh, that's the one that you remixed, right? Yeah. It's just so crazy that, 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 that the truth has become this, you know, I don't know. You, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's just. Well, it's. Uh, it's so sad and so stupid to just yeah, you but know, the, be watching it happen. The truth is, uh, is it subjective? You know, there's a whole philosophical debate you can have about it because, like, sure, like, sure. is you know what's true for one person or another? But then it's like you have to accept right. the fact that there's an objective reality. Uh, yeah, and then there's like some canonical truth. Otherwise, you're in this weird subjective reality, non-truth existence and it gets very metaphysical at that point right right you know, and right. uh I, I, I guess specific, specifically i mean like things like you know flat earthers oh, and things yeah. like that you know and, and you know there are elements of that in sort of anti-vax you know do the research and um the fact that the united states probably won't reach herd immunity because too many people won't get the vaccine because they I don't think, trust vaccines, and you know, I mean, that's I think I, that's bad. I don't know. I think we might because I think people who got COVID are probably larger than they think. You know, they always say that. You know, so right, yeah. right. I think you and, should and get, yeah, no, nobody knows really, right? Yeah, I think once we get like, it just seems like the numbers started going down unless we get some crazy new variant in here from India. You know. <laughs> um, where shit is really hitting the fan. But you know what's fucked up about the India thing? Like, so their positivity rate was like 15% or something of the tests. Supposedly, you know, they're always saying they're under reporting or whatever. But that's what it was. Yeah, in, yeah. That's what it was in Michigan last month. It was up to 15%. And we were open. Like, the governor was like, fuck closing. We're not closing. Uh, because people over 60 are vaccinated or whatever it was, 65 or something. And yeah. we, stayed, we stayed open and the numbers started going down, sure enough, you know, because <laughs> nobody knows how to handle this whole thing at all, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, it, but it's just crazy that the 15% in Michigan, it was like, yeah, there's hospitals are kind of full, but, you know, we're dealing with that. In India, they're like, we're burning bodies in the street, fuck it, you know, like, there's, yeah, it's just like the numbers game when you get so many more people, and like fifty percent of like one point four billion, whatever, whatever they got. Right, it's just so right. many people, you know. I don't know. So many people, and and society there is different in in how concentrated it is, right? Like, so yeah. if you're saying okay, everybody work from home, well, chances are there could be fifteen people living in that house, you know. No, it's, it's uh, there, there yeah. are more people, and they're on top of one another. You know. Yeah, the whole health, you know, like America is one of the most obese countries in the world. You know, and yeah, like nobody talks about that when talking about COVID. I mean, or, may, uh, you know. that could be number. Eight. I think it's probably number one. Like, I think it's probably the most obese country. Are we number uh, number one here? Probably. I'm, sh I'm sure it's, e it's easily searched, but yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know, yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> we're we're. Uh, let me see. Let's see. I'm gonna search it, but yeah, I believe it. I mean, come on, you know. Yeah. Let's see. Number one obese country in the world. Maybe it's Canada. Survey says. <laughs> Maybe it's Canada. <laughs> you know, that would be cool. Good for something, I mean, you know. <laughs> I think about Homer Simpson. Uh, Canada, America, Junior. <laughs> kind of, they're like, uh, I don't know. Oh, wait, there's a whole bunch of them. 
that are uh, more than us. Someone's got to be number one. Really? Well, yeah, apparently. Who's number one? We're number 12, dude. Number 12? Who, no, who's number one, dude? Naru. I don't know where the hell that is, but it, they have 61% obesity. That's Naru. like... Naru? How, how do you spell that? N-A-U-R-U. Nauru? Nauru. Nauru. That's a, yeah. That's a country? Uh, yeah, it says. Oh. 61%. Well, Cook Islands, 55.9. Palau, also, I don't know where that is. 55%. Marshall Islands, also, don't know. All these countries, I don't fucking know where the hell they are. Uh, I'm going to guess those, those ones we don't know are maybe also Pacific Island nations, because. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But like Samoa, you know, Samoans are big, I guess. Right, Samoans are big, right. But what is huh. that like a cultural thing or what is it like a... I mean, if you're saying that the top five are all Pacific Islands, I mean, it's got to be somehow cultural, right? Something. Even if, it's, even if it's not internal to the culture, like if it's external because of the isolation or something. Micronesia, sure. Federated States of 45%. And then Kuwait is right above us. But we're number, Really? Yeah, but we're number 12 at 36.2%. All right. But, you know, there's 198 countries, so it's not like we're... Uh, or 191, I guess. How many do they have here? Uh, number 12. Oh, wait, hold on. Am I looking at the wrong? What does it say? Percent of adult population that is obese. And what's this one? This one is. Anyway. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we're number 12. Americans Can are fat. Canada is 26. They're slacking. Yeah. <laughs> United Kingdom's thirty-three. I don't know. No. Vietnam is the last. It's one hundred ninety-one. Okay. And they're wow. Two point one percent obesity. And you know what's going on in Vietnam? They like smashed COVID. No COVID. They've been open this whole really? fucking time. Yeah, like pretty much. Wow. They have, like, they have like single digits of COVID cases a day from people that try to enter their country and have to quarantine and shit. Wow. <laughs> they figured it out, man. <laughs> New Zealand also, right? Isn't New Zealand pretty Yeah, New Zealand did good, but they're like, you know, they're far. Isolated. And isolated yeah. but vietnam has like 100 million people and they're not all rich and stuff they're poor you know right but right i don't know right so and uh, all that southeast asia i mean is all kind of clustered and uh, a lot of shared borders and stuff too right um my uh, uh uh a good buddy of mine who i work for also is in bangkok and Th thailand is now like locked down Oh, is it? I thought they were doing good. Yeah. It's not, huh? They were doing good. Yeah, they were doing good. And now they're not. They're not doing good. Yeah. They got a little too cocky. They're like, and I mean, India was doing really good too. And then obviously now they're the worst. If you look at that India curve, it's crazy. Like it's exactly like yeah. the definition of the exponential curve. It just goes like yeah. here, here, and then like in like yeah. a few days, like 15 days or something. Yeah. It just blew yeah. up. Yeah, like two weeks. And yeah. I think they, as of like two days ago, was the single most positive cases yet anywhere. It was like over 400,000 in one yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's where, crazy. I mean, that's the crazy thing because that's how variants are made when you expose that many people. Right. And they're like, oh, let's right. see what happens here. And the virus is like, yep. yes, breeding ground. Yep. You know? uh, Petri dish, yeah. All right, hot take. Was it created in the lab or not? No. No? Come on. It's got to no. have been created in a lab. There's a lab no, I... right there. No. No, no, no. 
No. What about Occam's no. Razor? It's the simplest explanation. Occam's Razor says that it's not created in the lab. It? No, no. It says it's created in a lab. Because, listen, there's a lab there no way. where they work on bad coronaviruses. And it was they're saying that it actually came from 100 miles away and traveled somehow to this market that's two miles away from this lab. It doesn't make sense. I think I, I think that naturally occurring coronavirus is the, the simpler explanation than one made in a lab, uh, right? Isn't that what Occam's razor is? No, it's, no our, Occam's razor is, is the simplest explanation, but in this case, it seems yeah. like they were working on the coronaviruses in that lab. They were bat. They were, you know, and they were making them they were experimenting with them so they can see how they can stop them, I guess. I don't know why, you know, there's, I'm just saying yeah. it, just because Trump said it doesn't mean it's not true. Okay. I'm just saying that's so funny because like maybe they get the broken clock is right twice a day. All <laughs> right. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. You might've been right. You know, what, <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? It ties together uh, going back to Justin from low res too, is, uh, you know, that story that broke last week that Ted Nugent had tested positive. Oh yeah. Yeah. I sent that link to, I, I sent that link to Justin and he sent back bat scratch fever. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. That's good. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. I thought. Good I have old. to give him the credit. I have to give him the credit. That was all him on that. Bad no. stretch fever. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. yeah. Well, Ted yeah. is, you know, well, he was. Yeah. Uh, we don't need to talk about Ted. Well, I mean, you know, he, he was kind of denying COVID or some shit, right? He um, was. Yeah. Yeah. And then he got yeah. it. Which is, you know, it's, I mean, people. It's are another not, example of it's not real until it happens to me. Right. Well, you know, it's hard to believe in things that are invisible. So I think it requires a certain leap of imagination. And uh, I mean, you, you've never seen the earth as a sphere with your own eye. Yeah, but there's a lot of pictures. <laughs> you know? Oh, they're from yeah. Photoshop, bro. Yeah, the funny, yeah. So like uh, listening to something or reading something, how YouTube algorithm works and how it like starts suggesting that. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause you could be like anti whatever vax, you know, or something. And then and you'll you start, start to see, yeah. You start to see as like, oh, by it. By it. if you like this one, you might like this flatter shit too. And then you start watching yeah. that, you know, right. It's, right. it's like the little rabbit hole. You got to train that yeah. thing. I, I love it though when people are like this. This algorithms are like destroying us or something. It's like you can train them. You don't have to click on sure. those videos. Like if you want to just, right. you, you know, I got a bunch of like YouTube stuff that's just like gear tutorials. You know. Yep. Yep. Like, what's up? Like, it just shows me that because I keep clicking on those. You know. Right. Yeah. Like we're in control. There's a. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. I, um, I like to follow hashtags too, you know, so I'll follow hashtags on Instagram of like hashtag synthesizer, you know, and I end up the, the Instagram algorithm will start showing me more stuff about synthesizer, you know, and I mean, I, I find that kind of useful Yeah. because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have found those results if I had searched for them, you know? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. What's your favorite like delay and reverb plugins right now? Uh, my favorite reverb plugin by far is the Adaptive Verb. This thing is I, I put it on like half the tracks in my mixes lately. Really? Um, oh, look at yeah, it. it's it's very um, the the thing that sets it apart is that it is very tonal. Mm. And it has a lot of really cool tonal presets where, you know, it's, it's tuned, you know, right in the drop down, it'll call out the key. And it's very handy for, you know, things like snare drum, mm. um, but also melodic stuff too. You know, I mean, um, pedal steel guitars, you know, things that, that you want to kind of be mournful, cellos, stuff like that, vocals, obviously. But yeah, it's uh, definitely the adaptive verb. 
is the best reverb I've heard in. Jesus, year. So why? why is it why is it two hundred and forty dollars? That's crazy. It's two hundred and forty dollars, man. It is. It's worth every penny. Every okay. penny. All right. No, that's uh, I mean, that that is how much like a good guitar pedal would cost too, you know. So. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And uh, favorite delay. I don't. I don't know if I have a favorite delay. There's a, a stock delay in Pro Tools. It's one of their acquisitions, I think, called the H delay. Okay. Which I like it's very noisy. Mm. This is the only problem. I mean, it sounds like you are like recording to a set. <laughs> Weird. It's got that. It's got that hit. Yeah, but it's fun. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that the reverb is tonal because it, you do notice like, uh, or I guess it's maybe it's not a common known thing, but like when you put reverb on vocals, it can like. Uh, detune you know not detune but like it fucks with the pitch right yeah right i yeah. guess because of what the reverb is i'm not sure what the math is there but so if there's something that can like not do that that's yeah yeah and yeah this you can obviously it's a plugin you can automate every aspect of it and you, you can automate the key changes if you want you know, just along the timeline, mm -hmm. you can just draw whatever key you're in at whatever moment, you know? Oh, and interesting. The, the, re the reverb trail off will, will change tune, but it'll stay within its same, like, sort of, you know, decay parameters and get the rest of the reverb characteristics will remain the same and just the tone will change, which, which is fun. That can lead to a bunch of pretty cool stuff, too, if you start chopping that up. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm getting into some plugins. You know, I got, I got some. I got the Nave from Waldorf. I don't know if you ever checked those guys out. Uh, I'm Wayno. familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah, that one is great. It's some kind of like wavetable thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's there's a few. There's there's some interesting world because. I sit here and all all this gear and I just do stuff, everything in Ableton's, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, all right, yeah, I should really like, <laughs> like use one yeah. of these things, you know, <laughs> um, no, it's fine. Yeah. Anyway, well, it's, it's good to talk to you, Mike. And, uh, yeah, this is real. It's great. Great to talk to you as well, sir. We've only talked to you text and, and email for a couple of years now so yeah it's definitely i know good. i think the, the last time i talked to you in uh well voice we were in person in uh, in detroit we went to john king book yeah no because i came out to la after that oh, right. la yeah. yeah yeah that that doesn't compute in my brain because it's it, it was it's rare to see you in la that's right yeah yeah that was uh I hope to, yeah. Yeah, and you and Dave and your other buddy uh, came over. And, Cody, and yeah. I saw you at, uh, yeah, Cody. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, man. it's... Uh, oh, yeah. Great to talk to you too, man. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to more sick joke stuff. Keep him uh, pumping those things yeah, out. Yeah, so we, uh, we did a remix of... Uh, we've done three remixes now. Well, actually, the third one is almost done. Mm -hmm. um, for our... our fellow pop international artists. So um, the first one was for Stoneburner that came out a couple weeks ago. The second one is not out yet, but it's done for Johnny Tupelev. And then the third one, which is almost done, is for Black Needle Noise, which is John Fryer's own band. Interesting. And um, this song, the Black Needle Noise track that we're remixing has a really great vocal in it too. Um, I forgot the artist's name. Azam, I think her name is Azam Ali. I probably am getting it wrong. Apologies. But yeah, really haunting kind of a, uh, it almost reminds me of like the last temptation of Christ soundtrack or something, sort of a uh, oh, wow. you know, Middle East, Middle Eastern African type of influence. I like that. Yeah. So, so sick joke to make a long story short, has been doing a bunch of remixes lately and we will be writing more original stuff. Um, we kind of have some stuff work in the works, so hope, hopefully we'll like finish another EP like by the end of this year type of thing. And hopefully yeah. you will do another remix. Of course, we love yeah. your remix. Oh, thank you. That remix, that remix slaps, <laughs> as the kids say. 
Yeah, I just went for that 808 because I was. I oh heard, yeah, I heard the beat in there. I was like, hey, let's bring that out. Boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> boom. Yeah, that was, that was good. Was that an actual 808 or was it just 808 samples? Or... Uh that is the massive actually. Um, oh, okay. Uh, it's a uh, it's a patch called like Trappist Kick or something like that, but it's just you know. The fake yeah. gateway for sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's all the same. So um, Yeah. Cool, man. Very good. Um, well good to talk to you. I'm gonna stop recording yes, sir. here. And then-